nanohub.org. Online simulation and more for nanotechnology. Okay, so welcome back uh, to EC695 Fiber Optic Communications. So what we're going to talk about today is an extension of our previous discussion on lasers. And so now we're going to be talking about uh, the specific things that come into play with semiconductor lasers. And then this is in the background just an example of the emission pattern uh, of a UV laser, uh, which is uh, made basically from zinc oxide, but it also has obviously other layers in the structure. Uh, so you can kind of see it. Um, now, first of all, we've been talking about kind of like this uh, kind of generalized two-level system before. Um, and this was basically our lasing transition system. So we were thinking of a laser as simplified to two levels, like essentially uh, upper level and the lower level. And the idea was that we want to have population inversion between those two levels. So we're still calling them one and two. But then what I'm talking about today is basically how can we design like something that's realistic, that's fairly general, but gives you good performance for a laser? And so the answer is basically we need a four-level pump. So first of all, uh, why do we need uh, the extra level below? Uh, the reason why we need this level down here, this ground state, is because if we didn't have a ground state, then we would have a big uh, issue with maintaining population inversion because now you would need to pump this up at a very high high rate. Because we said that if we don't have population inversion between these two levels, this stimulated emission turns into absorption, which obviously is bad for creating laser light. Uh, so we need to have this extra ground state. And since we already used one, we're calling it zero, the ground state. Uh, but furthermore, uh, we also want to add uh, a third level up here. Okay, so why is this uh, level important? Uh, so what's nice about having this extra system here is now we can actually have more favorable dynamics for pumping from the ground state to an excited state because while we want to have a high population in two, we don't want to have a high population in the state we're pumping into. And the reason is very simple because we won't be able to absorb as much light or excite as much uh, uh, of the ground state into the excited state if we're going directly into a population inversion state. So then that's why the four level approach is a really uh, beneficial one to get high performance in, in lasers. Um, but of course, we still have like at the core kind of this one to two transition. And there are, of course, variants on this where we would not have like directly this third level, but we would just have zero, one, and two. So that would be called a three-level laser. But I mainly focus on four-level lasers since that's the best performance. And if we reduce the four-level system back to the one, one to two level, then what you get is like, like very closely related to what we saw last time. So basically now the pumping rate, which I called R from zero to three, becomes the also the pumping rate into two, as long as three decays to two very quickly, and so R2 equals R. So then the, that basically gives you um, a pumping rate of R, and then we can actually now write the uh, excited state uh, inversion uh, population difference, and not in uh, kind of ideal conditions before the laser turns on, as depending on this pumping rate R, times tau t, which is, again, the lifetime of the second state, uh, times one minus this correction factor, okay? So, but basically the easiest way to look at it is just r times tau t, which hopefully makes sense because basically the excess population should be equal to pumping rate times lifetime, right? So that's just, uh, you know, in equilibrium, that should be happening. And this, of course, doesn't include any optical transitions explicitly, but tau t is implicitly including like uh, spontaneous emission and so on. So that's basically uh, what it boils down to in, in terms of the inversion. Um, and so now if we apply this uh, whole framework to semiconductors, so um, it's just slightly more complicated in the following sense. So uh, before we were talking about essentially having uh, levels that are very flat, so it basically has zero curvature in the band structure, so that means the second derivative is also zero, which theoretically is like the infinite uh, 
effective mass in the conduction and valence game. Obviously, in practice, they're always finite. So that means that uh, you will have actually, uh, instead of having like just basically a sharp transition uh, at a single energy, you'll have a range of energies over which transition takes place. And furthermore, because we have more states as we move away from the conduction band minimum and valence band maximum, then we actually have a peak not right at the band gap, but it's slightly above the band gap, you know, plus KT or so. So you can actually see here uh, that for this particular example of a semiconductor laser, you may have a band gap around 0.91 dB, but actually the peak is closer to 0.94, which corresponds to adding about 1 KT to the energy, okay? Uh, so that's like kind of the spectral distribution of gain. And then furthermore, uh, the gain uh, is going to be linear to pump rate. So this is very similar to like what we were just talking about. And therefore, uh, you know, it's also linear in the population inversion. And we can actually write down a very simple kind of empirical expression to look at the gain um, of the population inversion, like right at the peak uh, energy or wavelength, uh, which corresponds to basically just a linear function of n. And so basically the terminology is very critical. Just understand what each of these terms is. So N is basically uh, the population inversion and NT is what we call the transparency uh, pr uh, population inversion. So that's basically uh, the level of population inversion needed for light to pass through without absorption or loss. Okay. And so basically any degree to which the population inversion is above that basically gives you gain. Yes, you had a so question. So N big T is not N little t. Yeah, Just yeah. Sure. Yeah, so before N sub little t was actually a total um, population of both the upper and lower state. And here N sub capital T is a transparency. So I realized that uh, there's a lot of uh, notation that looks very similar in this class. So sorry <laughs> for any confusion, but I hope, hope that makes sense. Um, so, but thanks for the question. Um, and then if we look at, uh, you know, empirical data on what happens with gain as a function of this uh, carrier density, um, and of course, you know, the way to look at this carrier density is basically this is uh, kind of a slightly indirect measure of population inversion, but it's basically uh, looking at like what is the, uh, the minority carrier population uh, and then, of course, it hasn't subtracted the lower level, but we can we can assume that that's some value. And then that just shifts the uh, the effective n sub t. So in, in practice, like this graph here, where you see almost a straight line as a function of carrier density for the gain, is essentially a very similar expression. But it, here it's just like g p of delta n is sigma g delta n minus delta n t. Right, so just a delta n instead of an n, right? So, but the data is very consistent with this assumption that gain basically is proportional to the um, uh, the value of either carrier density or uh, population version, right? So, so at least uh, there's pretty good data to support this. And of course, you could write down a lot of equations to calculate exactly what's happening here, but I think. For the purpose of this class, this will actually be uh, quite quite adequate to understand what's happening. Um, one other thing that's important, though, that we need to talk about is basically the saturation effect. And so the idea of saturation is very simple. It just says that if we have a lot of photons in the system, then we're going to already have uh, had some spontaneous emission happen. So actually, the uh, the gain is going to be uh, lower than it would be before, right? And so basically, this uh, equation basically captures the uh, the decrease in gain, and so it just goes like one over one plus phi, like a, a flux of photons divided by phi saturation. Um, and phi saturation is actually defined explicitly as uh, one over the lifetime. Of the uh, of the excited state times sigma of nu, which is basically the uh, the probability of uh, absorption at a given uh, frequency. Okay, and so 
Of course, we also still have the line shape considerations as well, that basically a different new, you have different gains. But you observe that comparing this graph here uh, to here, actually, like the shape is slightly different. Okay, so basically what this tells us is we get something that looks more like a upside down uh, a parabola in the case of uh, semiconductors, whereas in the case of uh, line or atomic type transitions, then we get something more like a Lorentzian. But obviously the uh, behavior is fairly similar, uh, but just to be aware that you have different line shapes and the, li the line shape difference is caused because you have multiple transitions in semiconductors, whereas atoms usually just have a single transition, that's Lorentzian. And then uh, obviously the next step is since we understand the gain and uh, frequency dependence and saturation effects, now we actually want to put this type of medium into an optical resonator and see what happens, right? So there are going to be two things happening. So there's obviously going to be losses like from the resonator itself. And so here basically you can capture it as basically consisting of three terms. There's first of all, like reflection at both ends are causing uh, some losses because usually reflection is less than one. And then we also have like any parasitic absorption, uh, which we could call like distributed loss, if you will. Um, and then that allows us to then construct that there's an overall uh, distributed loss coefficient that's basically like parasitic loss in the bulk of the resonator plus these effective alpha M alpha alpha M1, alpha M2, and these are just basically uh, taking R1 and R2 and then putting it into the exponential, so then that basically gives you these log terms. And so as you can see, if the resonator gets longer, then the effective loss of each mirror becomes smaller. So then that's a potential advantage of making the resonator bigger, although we'll talk about what are some potential disadvantages in a minute, right? So you don't want an infinite size laser necessarily. Okay, so any questions right now? Okay, so far so good. Okay, so then for the next part, I'm gonna talk about what conditions are needed for lasing to really occur. Okay, so basically we need to put together all the pieces that we've discussed so far, and we need to satisfy the following two conditions. So the first is gain condition. And so basically the gain condition means that you have enough of population difference that you can, uh, reach or exceed the pumping threshold for lasing to occur. Um, so this means that essentially the gain has to be uh, equal to all the losses and you know light that's leaving the system. Uh, so it's basically achieve steady state. And then second is a phase condition. And the phase condition is important because that tells you how many different uh, lasing frequencies are allowed, okay? So this basically says that if you go in the round trip through the laser resonator, you have to have uh, constructive interference with itself, right? Otherwise, it wouldn't survive. Okay, so for gain, I mean, I think the concept is very easy. Gain is greater than or equal to total loss. Um, and so the idea is basically that if you're <coughs> looking at uh, like a threshold population difference, I should have written this N capital T, by the way, sorry. So basically this N capital T or transparency threshold population difference is the point at which uh, basically uh, you should be able to uh, get this gain to be greater than the loss. And of course, there are many ways to write this. Uh, obviously, I don't expect you to memorize all of them. But uh, the, the key point here is that typically it's proportional to uh, alpha R divided by some kind of cross section. Okay, so then the threshold always depends on the uh, the resonator that's involved, right? So there's no like absolute value of minimum gain or minimum population inversion, but it does have to be obviously positive. Um, so if it's negative, as you know, it just becomes an absorber. There's no gain, so you can't do anything with lasing. But if it has some gain, then if you design the right resonator, it might have potential to lease. Yes, sure. What? Oh, what is cross-section? Yeah, so in general, so this is a concept from atomic uh, lasers or basically gas lasers. And so, uh, and this can of course be extended to the semiconductor. So in atomic lasers, the idea is like every time light comes in, it has a, a probability 
of interaction. And that probability can be expressed as a cross-sectional area. And so it's, a, it's basically saying, like, what's the effective size of each atom that's absorbing? And so if you have, like, a lot of atoms, then, uh, you know, the cross-section doesn't necessarily have to be that big. If you have less, obviously you need more. Uh, but, and then this, this basically means that if you have a low cross-section, um, then you're likely to have a larger population difference because, like, you're not interacting as much with each atom. So that's what it means. Yeah. So then this brings me to the second criteria for lasing to occur, which is uh, the phase condition. And so the phase condition just tells us, like, like I said before, we need to complete a round trip um, that, that uh, generates constructive interference. And so what this amounts to in practice is that uh, there are basically two terms of phase shift, uh, one of which is propagation uh, through the bulk, um, even if it was a so-called cold cavity or there was no gain medium. And so this is 2kd, so you may know, typically you can write a plane wave as e to the minus ikx. And so that means that the phase that you pick up in one pass through the system is going to be uh, basically the argument of that exponential, so it's going to be uh, basically k times the length d, okay, so kd, but then we're talking about a round trip, so that's where you get the 2kd. At the same time, though, there's, in addition to this cold cavity phase, there's also this uh, phase that's associated with the gain medium, and so this adds an extra term on top of the cold cavity in the absence of the gain medium. But then basically k and phi enter essentially in the same way. So basically this phi term is very analogous to the, the k term here. And so when you add these two, two pieces together, then these have to be a multiple of 2 pi. Uh, okay, so then that basically tells you like what is the mode spacing that's allowed in the laser. And so as you can see, like basically the longer the laser is, then the tighter the spacing is between adjacent uh, modes that are present, right? So then, in other words, you're allowed to have like much smaller uh, frequency difference between adjacent modes. Uh, so then that means that if you make infinitely long laser, you're going to have like an arbitrarily large number of modes, and it's basically going to approach a continuum. And so that's not necessarily what you want, though, because oftentimes you want to laser at one wavelength, not every wavelength. Uh, so that, that can be an issue, potentially. When you're actually lasing the system, then what's happening is basically you're starting with this gain that was gamma naught up here, and then you're actually uh, increasing the photon flux, and you're basically uh, reaching this uh, steady state condition. And so what's happening is the following. So first of all, you had gain greater than loss to start off with, but then that means that you're building up more and more intensity in the cavity. But you just have to keep building it up and building it up until you start to get this saturation effect that I mentioned earlier kicking in, the 1 over 1 plus 5 over 5 saturation, to the point that you're basically emitting light. And you're emitting enough light so that it balances out all the power that you're putting into the system with the pump. And so what, what that means in practice is basically as you increase the pumping rate, uh, the population uh, difference is going basically from uh, essentially zero, which doesn't really uh, necessarily lease because you have losses, to something that reaches this threshold population difference. And then once you go past this population threshold difference of NT, then you actually get uh, photon flux density is increasing. So in other words, you're now actually emitting light, like laser light. And so that means like when the gain uh, basically uh, gives you population inversion that's well above zero, then that's when you potentially start getting lasing kicking in. And then this uh, slide here is just showing that the photon uh, flux density is typically given by this saturation flux density that I mentioned earlier times uh, the population difference divided by the threshold minus one. And so then that, that basically tells you it's just linear in uh, basically the degree to which you're above the population threshold. So the, the fractional percentage, if you will, above threshold. And so you can see that for 2 NT, then you reach phi S. Uh, for 3 NT, it would be like 2 phi S and so on. So conceptually, it's very simple. Obviously, if you're below 
threshold, then you don't get any leasing at all. Um, and so this is something that's actually always like a, a key characteristic of lasers. If you don't see like this thre threshold behavior, it's probably not a laser. Or it's something really impressive, uh, <laughs> which we haven't seen before. Okay, so then this brings up another question of basically how do you get like, uh, you know, as much photon flux as possible if you want an efficient laser? Um, so then basically there are a number of ways you can try to do this. Um, here basically, uh, we estimated that the, uh, the optimal, uh, transmission would be actually be, uh, basically approximately given by this term where basically G naught is like kind of the gain, uh, uh, factor, which is basically the gain coefficient times the length times two because you have a round trip. Uh, and so if you take this G naught and the, uh, overall, uh, basically absorption coefficient of the laser L, then you can actually combine these two into optimal, uh, amount of, uh, transmission, which is square root of the, uh, product of these two minus L. Okay. And so obviously I've skipped through the calculation, but it's fairly easy to just write down the expression and then solve it for that expression by setting the, uh, the amount of light equal to zero and varying uh, G naught and L. So if we look at like what is the, um, you know, the curve that I was talking about, um, you know, it basically looks like this. Uh, so you can see that if the mirror transmittance is zero, then you obviously will not get the most laser light out uh, because if you had a uh, zero transmittance, that means it's stuck there forever. So anything else that can absorb light will eventually do so. Um, so you'll never see any light. But if transmittance is very large, that's also bad, of course, because that means that basically it doesn't have enough time to build up the mode. So you basically are targeting something that's in between. So it's like you have a little bit of transmittance, but you still mostly reflect the light. And this is not like this value here is not in any way like a, you know, universal value. It just completely depends on your design. If you have like a lot of gain, um, very quickly, then it's likely you want a higher mirror transmittance. Um, if you have very low gain, then you probably need like a very low, uh, transmittance. So you can like build it up many, many times, right? So it just totally depends. Uh, so, so while this kind of general shape is fairly universal, uh, the peak, could be like below 10% and that's very common result. Um, or it could be, you know, like, uh, you know, less than 1% or it could be like maybe even 50%. And there are some lasers that are considered to not have cavities, quote unquote, not have cavities. But the reality is there, there is a cavity. It's just a very like, uh, you know, uh, weak resonator. So in other words, um, it has a low quality factor, but it's still a resonator in some sense. So that's basically the key takeaway from this analysis. Um, and so then if we try to look at, like what's the overall output flux of these lasers, then you can basically say the following. So more or less that um, we can break down the total amount of output into three terms. And if, if we normalize by volume, we can even cut it down to two terms. So we can say basically the output flux per unit volume, this V, is, is basically the extraction efficiency. And so that's essentially just a kind of a simple way to write down all those considerations we were talking about earlier, you know, which include, uh, you know, essentially like useful, uh, processes that, that lead to loss from the cavity. So basically a transmission of useful light out of the cavity, uh, divided by like things that are, you know, both parasitic and non-parasitic loss. So it's basically the ratio of useful emission or loss to total loss. Okay, so that's what A to E is. So you can think of it as a quantum efficiency. And then this R minus RT term is very closely related to what we were talking about a few slides ago, where basically we said we have to be above a transparency threshold or we won't get any lasing, right? So it's the same exact idea as you saw a couple of slides ago back here. So this R minus RT is, is essentially just uh, directly proportional to this axis here for pumping rate. 
So those are the only two terms that you really need to write down the output flux, eta, E, and R minus RT, if you define uh, output flux for unit volume, right? And here I basically just wrote down on the bottom of this slide, here are some like, kind of whoops, approximate expressions. Uh, so just to say that extraction efficiency typically depends on the, uh, the pump lifetime uh, divided by uh, what's called, uh, I guess you could say the, uh, the spectral uh, inverse uh, spacing, TF. And so basically the spectral inverse spacing, sometimes it's called like the free spectral range. So the, in, the free spectral range is given by uh, the speed of light divided by twice the length of the cavity. So as you can see, like 1 over TF will go inversely with the length of the, the laser. So you basically get tighter and tighter spacing between modes. Uh, but then uh, if you have a 1 over TF that's uh, very uh, small, which corresponds to a large D. Uh, let me make sure I'm saying this right. <laughs> uh, 1 over TF. If 1 over TF is uh, small, then that means that we have a large D. Um, but then we also have potentially a lower extraction efficiency. So that's part, so basically the need to avoid multiple modes in lasers is one reason not to have a really long one, but also the extraction efficiency can be reduced in some cases if you make it too long. Uh, so that's an issue. But obviously it has to be long enough so you can build up the mode. So you need to have like kind of optimal length of the laser. Um, and then uh, the other thing that basically I showed here is basically just a definition that's good to know, which is the slope efficiency. And so what the slope efficiency is, is basically a measure of uh, once you, you pass the threshold for a laser and then you're in this linear growth regime, like how much extra power you get out versus every unit of power you put into it, right? And so typically the efficiency until you reach threshold is zero for a laser, but once you hit a threshold, then your slope efficiency can actually be pretty high. It can be above 50% potentially. So then that means that if you operate a laser like well above threshold, you're most likely to get a highly efficient performance. And of course, I already explained these two uh, conditions, but this is basically a very uh, technical way to write down those two conditions that I was talking about. So I just included that here um, from, uh, I think this was Sally and Tyke, just to make sure that you are familiar with this uh, set of conditions and you have like mathematical basis to calculate them. But in the end, basically what's happening is we have like a bunch of modes in a given resonator, and we also have some sort of gain spectrum, which in this case I drew as basically upside down parabola based on the semiconductor case. And then here, basically, um, we may have just one mode where the gain is equal to loss, and then that therefore will be our lasing mode. But of course, if we had a higher gain or lower loss, then you know the basically this would be shifted to here. And so you can see you could also get multiple modes in the system. And then they'll have this uh, sort of uh, spacing, which is determined by the so-called free spectral range, the C over 2D that I mentioned earlier. Um, so that's also known as nu sub f. Uh, 1 over TF is nu sub f. And then you can see that the total number of modes would be basically, uh, basically the number where you have uh, gain equal to or greater than loss. And so therefore you could have anywhere from one or zero, I should even say zero, you could have zero. So basically no mode has gain greater than loss to one where you have this situation to two to even like 10, 100,000 modes. And there are some lasers that have thousands of lasing modes, obviously, but there's some challenges with using them.